Uh, good afternoon or good morning, depending on where you are. Welcome to the uh, May Blanchard Systems Valley Tips and Tricks webinar. Uh, I hope everybody's safe, You're probably at home, sitting in your uh, your living room or your bedroom, and uh, hopefully about ready to learn something about some of the new ES6 features. My name is Mike Moscato. And I'm going to run through uh, a few select items from the new ES6 uh, release. Uh, real quickly, I think most of you who have been on here before know that we nag you about this uh, in terms of getting your display to scale properly. I don't think it's on the upper left anymore. It's on the upper right. But like I say, I think most of you have been on these before, and uh, you should be able to get this thing to display for you properly. So what are we going to do today? What are we going to do is we're going to review some of the new features in ES6. Uh, this is not a comprehensive overview of everything that's in there. That would be a pretty long webinar. Uh, instead, uh, the things that I chose were just some that I've been playing around with over the last couple of months that I think are useful, that uh, are, I think, hopefully fairly easy to explain and demonstrate in, in a webinar. Some of them, uh, in terms of, you know, I, I know a lot of times we try to give very specific use cases or best practices for how to do things. There's a few of these. Uh, I, I really think uh, the jury's still out in terms of how uh, users will want to use them, interact, and interact with them once they get their hands on ES6, which I think is a, a good argument for anyone, uh, any ES user, to put in an ES6 dev server uh, with either the existing beta or imminent official release and uh, kick it around and then tell Darlene, you know, I think this thing should work this way, which leads to the next question. When will we see ES6? The current official release date that we have from Darlene is end of June this year. That would be 2020. And I'm sure in, in the small print down at the bottom, it says subject to change. But, uh, you know, as recently as last week, we were still told that's when we should see it. So you can, you can take that to the bank. Okay, what are we going to look at today? Uh, I'm going to try to do it in this order. Uh, there's some new search options that give you a lot more flexibility. The multi-view thing in the dialogue, uh, some of you may or may not have heard of this, where you can actually throw up the uh, just big bunch of images side by side. Uh, delegation, which is a, uh, a feature that allows you to auto magically uh, send uh, or set approvals to different users if you are out on vacation. It has to work in conjunction with a calendar, which I'll show real quick. We're gonna look at the mail notifications panel, which gives you a lot more visibility as to what's happening, why it's happening, and when it happened. We'll look at something called collapsible job tickets, which uh, the term itself almost means nothing. But when you see it, you're gonna say, I gotta have that. I want the collapsible job tickets, no matter what it's called. And I'm gonna look at, uh, show you how to do a Dropbox ES file system. And again, that's that's one of these features that I think is uh, one that Dowling has put out there right now in a very basic manner, and I think they want users to use it, and or at least try it, and then come back with suggestions on what they think it should do, how it should do it, or maybe even if they don't see Dropbox as a viable uh, production tool. Okay. I think the Dropbox so is uh, basically Darlene's reply to what we've started seeing in a lot of RFPs from from potential customers. Dropbox was a requirement. Um, they did 
put it in there and are looking for any suggestions on how to make the most of it. Sorry. Okay, so now I, I said what I'm gonna do, so let's go ahead and try to do it. We start with the search stuff. And I, I'm gonna start out, I'm gonna be over here in Chrome because first uh, I wanna show you the problem that we're trying to solve or that I think we have solved uh, with this new option. So let's go do some search. Now, what do we know about the way you search in uh, ES5 or ES55? You basically have the different logical operators. You can you have an OR search, you can have an AND search, or uh, you could, I think those are the only two you can do. So if I'm searching, and it's kind of hard to see, I'm searching for an image. that It actually has a spaces in the name. So if I search for Hoy and 2, I found it, but I found 128 of his closest friends as well. And that's because I'm set for an OR search. So it basically chops this thing up into four different terms that it's searching for. So if uh, anywhere in the metadata or maybe the extracted text, the, uh, you know, you have a string AN, it's going to find it. It's going to return a result. So for something like this, let's say I know I'm, I'm going to be searching for a lot of files, the spaces and the names, the OR logical operator is going to work. So I'm sitting here in ES5 and go, well, what, what do I do? Well, you either log in as a different user profile or you go to your existing one and you tell it, all right, I guess I got to use the and thing. And then I got to log out. And I got to log back in. And do it again. Now, this is how you spell annoying, having to do something like this. But uh, I want to make the point, though, that once I have made the change, and this is an and search, okay, that's good. It got me what I wanted. And, uh, you know, an and, it has to include all those terms. I got a hit. So, you know, maybe I go ahead and I do a lot more searches with all these files with a space in the name, right? But, you know, the, the way life works, uh, eventually the bill comes due, right? So I have, I've tagged a few images in here. I've got some images that are sunsets, and I have some that are sunrise. I want to see them. I want to see my sunset and sunrise images. So what's going to happen here? I know I have them, but now I have the and operator. Well, I don't have any that are a sunset and a sunrise. So I'd have to go back and change back to an or, and then I'm gonna get cranky. Uh, that's just no way to live. So let's jump over to Safari where I'm already logged in. And you're gonna see that, uh, you're gonna see I have the wrong user profile set up. So let's go fix it and make it do the new do. Because what you'll see in your search settings is there's a new option here that's called custom. And let's see, I want to set this up the way it's normally set up. So what is this custom thing going to do? Now, now the, the fact is I should have had it set up already. Uh, so I shouldn't have to log out and log in. But so here's what happens when you get this custom guy. Remember earlier I had it on and. Well, I need an or, so there it is, boom. Now, now there, I now have my sunset and sunrises. And if I was doing that uh, that silly search I was doing earlier, right, hoy and jpeg we know the or don't work, but now I can just switch to the and and now get my result. That is a very, very handy feature. And, and frankly, I think that of, of the, the options you're seeing here right now, this is the one that I think is might be the most useful. Uh, there's another setting, though, that I suspect has been changed under the hood. 
And what I'm going to do is I'm going to connect to an ES5 server. And I want to show you another handy feature that, again, to, from, to, from what I've seen, it's kind of invisible. So I got a file over here. There it is. I'm going to search for it. Either it found it, but it found uh, 43 of his good buddies. Now, what one thing we know about ES55 is if you do a search like this and you're using the OR operator, it again separates these into different terms. So it's going to find anything that matches Heathrow, but also anything that has a .jpg extension. So again, this would be a case where you have to use the AND operator. In ES6, it doesn't care. So I'm going to look. I've got that let's see file over here as well. So if I search for that with OR, it only finds him. What about with AND? It only let's say neither. So they have done something apparently under the hood in terms of how it handles your file extensions now, where regardless of which operator you're using, it's going to include that or, or, or see that as one search term instead of Heathrow and JPEG as separate search terms. That's another very handy thing to work with here. Now let's, let's look very quickly at these other two options because I think they have a, very, a fairly limited value. This guy, exact. Now you see, I got the, I have exactly typed the name. There's the name. Let's do a search. You should find it. Of course, it doesn't. The exact uh, option is a very restrictive use case. The only thing it's, it will search for and find is metadata from extracted text. Now, what do I mean by metadata from extracted text? I'm talking about a PDF that's got text in it where we have the parameters set up to extract text as metadata. So the only thing that uh, that exact thing does is find metadata from here. So if you don't do that, you can pretty much ignore that guy he is of no use to you now i happen to know that i have the term possibilities exists in that file in the text and i found it that's good so what is this guy this guy called the fuzzy search got to speed up because we got other things to do but uh, i'll show you what fuzzy search does fuzzy is if let's say you uh that that file we had earlier that was uh what was it it was heathrow right so let's type it in but let's say i didn't really know how to spell it I, i'm looking for this thing it's uh maybe it's two e's right now the the, the fuzzy search will find stuff like that but right now you'll notice it's not going to find anything there's a restriction to using this option, which to me almost makes it a non-starter. And that is that the substring search has to be set to none. Because of that, we've already asked Dalim to include the substring search setting in this these fields that show for the uh, uh, for the custom stuff. Uh, let me see. There we go. You notice what I did? You know, maybe you don't notice. Let me zoom the screen. Does that zoom the screen there, Fred, for you guys? Yeah. Yeah, it does. Okay. The, 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 you'll notice what I did here is I stuck this little tilde after it. This is a, a method to do a fuzzy search without actually clicking the fuzzy search button. Because uh, I, I, frankly, these two don't behave the same way. You'll notice that with this search, I found Heathrow. If I turn it off and go fuzzy, 
doesn't find it. So there, there is a difference between how they've uh, implemented this guy versus this guy. So for, for what I've seen, you get more con consistent results using the tilde, which is a fuzzy search, versus the button that says fuzzy search. Uh, and I'll just do one more example. Remember the I, I just did the term possibilities, right? It'll find it. I think I did this before. I'm going to put a Z in there because I don't really know how to type. See, that'll work. So if you got one of those MacBook Pro keyboards that's got dirt under one of the, the keys, you know, you can turn a fuzzy search on and hopefully find the file. Uh, for me, the, the, the main takeaway with the search, though, is the fact that you can toggle the or and and now. Exact, if you do text extraction, maybe. Fuzzy search seems to work. I think it's more consistent if you put the tilde after it, which is supposedly the equivalent of that guy. Okay, we're going to move to the next thing, which is the uh, multi-file display. Now, to get started on that, we're going to do a search for a term that I think is very appropriate these days. That's booze. Uh, if you're locked down, you want to got you get yourself some booze. So here are four images. Let's open them up. This is what we're used to seeing in ES. You open some files, uh, four of them at once. Hope I'm not starved for memory right now. There we go. Now, what this multi search option does is it gives you, I mean, multi view option. Uh, let's see if I'm running out of memory here. Uh, one in doubt, try to refresh the browser. Let's try it again. Booze. Slow. Okay. If I right click on that top file, you get this open as option. I'm going to say open as a two by two block. So now you have all four files open side by side. Now there's a couple modes you can work this in. If you right click here, initially I'm going to turn this option off that says synchronized documents. So I'm going to zoom. It's going to zoom only on that file that I've selected there, right? I can zoom him. Zoom. And now again, it's working only the file that I have selected. However, and this is where the multi file view can tax your ES server. If you turn on synchronized document, first I'm going to tell it to zoom to fit. Now let's tell it to zoom one to one. So what's happening now is that your rendering is basically having to run different renders on every file that you've got in here at the same time. So as soon as you turn on the sync, every time I try to zoom, the render server fires for every file that I have open in there. Now with you know just four images, like this, or four, four PDFs, whatever. It's not that bad, but you know, I, I'm going to show you in a little bit. I'm going to open up about uh, 16 of them, and, and then that's when you call Dalene to buy more render licenses. But let's see some of the things you can do when you're in here. For instance, and, and one of the more difficult things in here is keeping track of which file is currently the active file. Look at the panel on the left. So if I click that guy, you notice it's highlighted in the light blue. That guy, light blue, that guy. 
but there's also an almost indetectable uh, light blue line that outlines the file that's selected, which you can see there. Frankly, I think it's way too subtle, and I've already told Darlene they have to make that much more bold. But when you're in this mode, you can just go ahead and annotate, you know, and say, you know, the, the bottom is cropped off and who shot this thing, right? And just to show you, you know, one of the other new features in here, I can go to this note. I can copy it because they screwed this one up too, right? So I can go right over here and paste the same note because those two are both no good. You can directly still in this mode. No, I don't want to prove it. You can reject a file. Jump over to this guy. He's no good either. Reject him. But what they need to do is they need to, you know, since I wanted to reject both of those, you really should be able to control or shift select to select multiple files in this view, but that currently doesn't work. So uh, that's why, you know, I, I think it's still, uh, people need to work with this to see what works best for them and, uh, you know, maybe come up with uh, best practices for how to work inside of here. I'm going to close this out. And I want to show you another couple of examples that also will kind of illustrate the logic that you have to work with in here. Hopefully these will behave better. I'm going to open all these guys up. So notice the first image up there is the red flowers, right? And I want to do the same thing I did previously. I'm going to say I want a two by two block. But notice which images it opens. If I select that top guy, it will go sequentially down and open the next tree after him. Right. But you know, let's I say, you know, those aren't really the ones I want. Yeah, I want to start with him. But I want to look at uh, some of these other flowers. How, how do I get them in the mix? What you do is you select this guy, the square on the top right that you don't want, and then you select the guy that you want to see in that slot. You select the one down here that you don't like, right, him, and you put in this guy in that slot. So you can still rearrange who you want to have in the mix. The other thing you'll notice, because I think I'm in the synchronized mode. Yeah, if you're in the synchronized document mode, I've got the bottom right guy selected. I'm going to hit zero for fit the window. So he gets fitted to window, but you'll notice this guy isn't. So because what it does is it applies the zoom factor required to get him to fit the window to everybody. So if you really want to get everybody fitted to window initially, you go into the non-synchronous mode and fit them all to window like that okay let's do one more and let's say i was in here and said all right that's cool i want to concentrate on this guy you just right click close other documents and now you can concentrate on him uh one other thing to point out i opened eight images here let's say i wanted to see them all well the options are two by two three by three four by four so I have to go to something that includes at least eight. I'll go to three by three. What's it do? It gives you it gives you all eight, but obviously it doesn't do a full three by three grid. But you can still display uh, a number of images that you know isn't directly correlated to the number in the grid that you chose. Uh, one last thing, you know, if, if you're really, you know, you really want to blow it up. I'm not really sure that anyone would do this because, uh, again, I tend to think the use case for this is if you've got maybe four or five similar files that you want to compare. But, you know, you can open a, a Big nasty bunch like this, and you know, to, uh, 
I have to see 16 of them? All right, I'll see 16. Now, this is really making my humble uh, little VM crazy right now because the, the, the renderer is going nuts trying to put all those guys up there. But you can do it if, if, you're, if you don't mind feeling the pain for a little bit. We should add and, that. And again, if, go ahead. If you want to keep your users from killing your server by doing this, you can limit the number of proofs that they can see in their user profile. Uh, then the other thing I, I would I would have to say is the uh, the synchronized document thing. You know, should only be used in uh, rare cases. Yeah, that's really killing my server, but I think I can escape. Okay, so let's move to the next one. Here's a project. And if we look at it, let's concentrate on the right hand column. I'm the approver for these. I've got two uh, approval steps, and I'm the approver for both of them. Let's look at the job ticket. There's me. I'm assigned to these roles. I'm doing a webinar today. I can't be approving files, I need somebody else to do it. I got the day off. Let's go and look at my user. There's this new option called user delegation. I have it enabled. So I have what's called a default delegate. This guy, Winston Rumford, he is going to have to take up the slack when I got the day off. And uh, unless I say otherwise, he'll get assigned to all of the roles I'm assigned to, unless I go down to this bottom area. And if I choose to, I can set up an entire list of different users per user role. Because maybe, you know, Marcellus Wallace is better suited at the production manager level. Okay, well, I already said I'm off. How does ES know that I'm off so that these guys get in the mix? The way it knows is you have to go to your calendar and you have to have your vacation and your days off scheduled in here. Well, I'm a little slow on the uptake, but today is the 20th. I'm going to say I want a day off. In fact, I want the whole day off. All day because of the weather. So what's going to happen? Let's go back to that project we were in right here. You notice already it's changed the setup within the project template. If I select any of these files and we look over there on the right-hand column, you'll see that these guys have now been added in. So they are now able to approve the files without any extra drama. Well, hopefully it's not considered drama. The other thing you'll notice down here is it, it will reference why they got stuck in because I am the delegator and I just told them, you know, I'm busy. You get in there and work. Now, one of the settings I should have showed you is that I have it set up to resend approval notifications, meaning now that they're in the mix, they're going to get notified, even though the files have been sitting at that approval step for a few hours, because I threw them in here a while ago. Now, I'm going to, I'm going to go over to the mail notification panel in a bit to show you how that all worked, but there's one other example I want to show here, and that is, uh, where is this guy? I basically want to show you how the, the, the delegation can work in layers. This job, we got Gus Fring, right? Breaking Bad. He's the approver. So he's got some delegating mojo too. Yeah, let's see, he's in here. So he's set, again, he doesn't he hasn't set his day off yet, but he's set to delegate to Walter White, right? So Not that calendar. So Gus decides to take today off. 
all day he's gonna uh, he's gonna visit Hector right we know it should happen right Walter White should be the approver now or added which he is but does this thing keep going a layer deep because let's say Walter White decides you know he needs the day off because he's going to he's going to kill Gus, right? You know, breaking bad. So what's going to happen? Well, he he's got a delegate. Will the delegate then delegate as well? If he's delegated to Jesse. And you can see it is. He's been at it now. So the delegation will just step down <laughs> till it finally some finds somebody who's working. Uh and again, you'll see how it updates the job ticket here to say Gus delegated to Walt, Walt delegated to Jesse. Now, you know, one thing I think uh, to keep in mind is as I was working through this, the fact is when you work with groups in ES, they are already kind of like, you know, oops, they're pseudo. Uh, they're pseudo delegators because you got a whole group of people who could approve at a point, but there's no way to suddenly notify them that somebody's not working and that they have to go and get in the mix. So that's where the, the delegation stuff comes in handy. So as I said, these guys should have got some notifications sent out to them. Go to our system tools. It's a new area here called notification monitoring. And I'm going to go very quickly through these tabs and show you what they mean. First off, let's look at the history. Well, you can see Jesse just got notified because Walt had the day off. You see Walt got notified because Gus, Gus had the day off. Here's the guys who got sent out notifications when I decided to take the day off. So what are we looking at here? This is the history. History will basically show you who got what and when. You'll also see, and this is something I just kind of discovered the other day, you do see the panel on the right that uh, displays the actual notification, and those are live links in there. Uh, if I go back to yesterday, I do have a record of what went out, but the previews go away. So currently, it's baked in that every uh, morning at 3 a.m., it will remove those. So the ones from today should be in here in terms of the preview still showing. Anything older than a day will still keep the record of who's been sent what, but you won't have the preview. I should mention, based on the question, uh, that this is all part of the new notification engine that Darlene built that's much more robust. That's why yeah. you're able to have this information available now and it can definitely be a much better notification system under the hood if you're doing you know thousands of notifications the uh the other tabs here we'll look at these real quick because they're pretty useful they give you a lot more uh insight into what's set up and what's going on than the the older subscriptions basically tells you who has notifications Define and what they are. So, for instance, Gus, he's set to get notified when files are uploaded and files on approval. Notice where it says next occurrence. So he's not going to. He's set, I think, for every three hours. So he's not going to get anything sent to him, or his cycle won't run again until noon today. And we already know he's set for files on approval. The notifications tab. Oh, this is just gruesome today. There we go. The notifications tab shows you uh, notifications that are still uh, essentially queued or waiting to go out because this guy's cycle hasn't come around yet. His next occurrence, I shouldn't have clicked that. Kind of hard to see when it's in blue. Let's go back. His next occurrence is midnight tonight, right? In fact, Let's do this real quick. Just gonna upload a file in here. It can be any file. 
Yeah, I guess that's as good as any other. So since Gus was sent, set to get notifications every three hours, notice he's now in the list. So he's going to get one sent to him, but it ain't going to go out till then. So if someone says to you, you know, I was supposed to get some notifications for this, that, or the other, your first check might be to look here and see if, yeah, you're, you're going to get it, but it's not to go, due to go out for another 15 minutes or 20 minutes or so. That's where this guy, the outgoing one, can be a good, bit confusing because he sounds a lot like the notification one. But outgoing is typically an area where you won't see anything. He will only show you entries if your mail server or your notifications got really backed up. So if you're, you know, sending out thousands and thousands of them and ES is, you know, taking a while to cycle through them, they will show here. Essentially, there are files where their, their time has come due to send, but there's so many in the queue, it's trying to work its way through to go out. Uh, unfortunately, my server, I've never had enough backed up where I've seen anything in there. You'll notice that you can actually stop and start their uh, notification engine from here. Uh, again, since uh, I haven't managed to hang it up so far, uh, the effectiveness of that clearing something that's stuck, I can't vouch for at this point. But that's what that guy does. History, I already went over. So that's the notification panel. I'm going to close Chrome for a second. I think I might need to close a few things and get a little memory back. Okay. Let's go to collapsible job tickets. This is a good one. And let's see, let's go to this file over here. So we know what job tickets are. We use them to maybe edit metadata, start user actions, things like that. So I'm going to right click this thing, go to properties. And I got a job ticket up there. This is one that I, I've used a few of the new components. So I got the, the whole keyword editor where I can tag keywords. I've got some of my favorite user actions displayed here. And I've also got just a simple panel that shows a bunch of EXIF information from my file. Fair enough. But, you know, if, if I want one thing we know is if you want to tag files, you have to do the dance, right? You got to right click, you got to go to properties, you got to get your guy, you got to do your thing, you got to hit OK and then come back up. I guess that works, but there's got to be a better way, right? So let's go to my job tickets, find that boy. There he is. Now, the first thing you notice is the job ticket editor looks totally different. I think we could spend an entire webinar going over this, but let's concentrate on the right-hand side here. A few of these settings are familiar to you. It's a global job ticket. It's for documents. But, you know, if you see a new button that you're not familiar with, the thing to do is to hit it, right? Collapsible panel. Sounds interesting. Let's try it. Let's go right back to that file. Let's click it and notice what we see. There's my job ticket displayed immediately for me in the right-hand panel, along with my other goodies. So you get basically instant access to your job ticket for any file sitting here in a project. It works in smart views, it will work in the file system as well. Now, I'm gonna show you a gotcha here real quick. Let's take uh, this file. So I wanna tag it. Uh, that looks like an iMac. 
in the screen, and it's made by Apple. So that should update my keywords. At least I think it should, right? Looks good to me. If we go here, keywords show up here, and I see none. So you scratch your head a bit and say, what do you mean? It's right there. I put it in the job ticket. How come it doesn't show up? And the problem that we have here is that we're used to, when we're working in job tickets, we're used to putting stuff in, putting stuff in, and then we hit OK, right? Well, you notice in my little panel here, there, there's nothing to OK it or update it. So if you ever start playing around with these things, you have to remember And you're just going to see a little new mojo here. You need to go to your components and find the logically named component called SMV Save Button, of course. Drag it. Now I've got a container down here at the bottom. I'm going to toss them in two. Drag them in there. Save it. Let's go back to that. Uh, to our guy, there's my save button now. Now, if I say iMac, Apple, and save it. Well, I think my machine's really having a hard time. Let's hit it one more time. Now it updates. I think you can see that over there. And I think it's it's really handy if you have a lot of uh, uh, user actions you use a lot. Just have them sitting right there in front of you. You don't have to go right-click user action and find it. Or go here and do the pull down. You just click it, whammo, hit it, off you go. And I notice if you now, set it up right or if you've tested this, but you should also be able to do that keyword modification or that on multiple files at once. So if you have to add metadata to several files same metadata you can do that over and over again actually i did do that before i mean let's say you get uh, these guys they're all the same picture he is a uh he's a heron he's at the park and he's on a bench so yeah you can you can whack a whole bunch of them all at once like that so if we go here and again, to me, the, the real test is not necessarily if it shows me a job ticket. It really needs to update the metadata. And you can see that it did. He's heron on a park bench. Uh, I'll also point out that, you know, this kind of thing isn't uh, limited just to documents. You could make a collapsible job ticket that's associated with a project. Now, you know, the, the fact is the project job ticket stuff usually shows up here and the fact is uh oftentimes it has to be because you're setting the parameters of a job to begin with and obviously this thing doesn't exist until a job is created but you know if you have things like maybe you run triggers and you need to quickly update uh, a metadata value for a project that will fire a trigger it's a little handier to get it here then you have to go back to job ticket, find it, click it, do it. You can present it directly right here. Collapsible job tickets. That's it. Let's look at Dropbox now. Nothing all that exciting with this. Because I'm going to show, I'm going to click on a file system and I'm going to see some files. Wow, that's that's new, right? But what is this? This is actually my Dropbox account. This is a folder full of files I have there. Uh, if I go to Finder, I think I'm going to I'm going to copy a couple of these. We'll do a copy. Here's my Dropbox. Camera uploads. That's all those files. 
So let's paste these guys in here. Don't think they're already there. Yeah, page eight and page seven. Now here you're gonna see the one big limitation for Dropbox. There's my two new files, right? Notice they're in italics. The one thing that Dropbox is missing currently is the monitoring option for an ESFS volume, meaning the only way it's going to recognize and pick up these new files is if you actually spin down the folder in ES. To, to me, that's a pretty big limitation. And I think you'll also discover if you test it, it's in my experience so far, it's it's, it's slower than working with uh, like an AWS uh, ESF volume. You can see my guy just showed up here. So it, it is ingesting them and it took a while. So how do you do it? How do you make a Dropbox? You'll see there's a there's new type here. There's Dropbox and Dropbox box business. The regular Dropbox is for you know a, a personal account, and you'll notice it doesn't even ask for a user and a password. What you have to do is you have to get this API access token to put in, and then that will allow you to connect. In fact, I'm going I'm going to go ahead and do it. I'm going to make a new Dropbox volume here and show you how to do it. Does it, it does not take long. It's pretty quick. In fact, I think I had it here. Yeah, these are the steps I'm going to go through. You have to create a, an app in Dropbox. In fact, once I click this link, I hope that link works. I think it does. Open link. Here we go. So I'm already logged in, right? So I'm going to go Dropbox API, full Dropbox. I'm going to give it a name. Uh, what's today? Wednesday. So I create my app. Now, in these settings, Have to have allow. That's correct. Ah, I'm trying to remember the next step. There we go. You go down to this guy, this auth two guy, and you're going to generate a token. Now, anybody you know decides they want to get my token, I'm deleting this app after the webinar, so it's not going to do any good. So I need that token. That's what I'm going to use in uh, ES to connect to this thing, right? So let's go back to ES. Tell them I'm going to make a new account, uh, file system. Drop, drop, drop. Put that token in. Once it's in, notice it's now browsing my Dropbox folders. Oddly, I have a folder called webinar. Let's save that. The rest of the stuff down here, you're probably used to if you set up the SFS volumes. You gotta give it a template, give it a smart view. Of course, you notice what's missing. Monitoring is not in here. Give it access rights. Say OK, save it. No. Do I have a new file system? Yes, I do. Is there anything in it? Yes, there is, but now it's going to take, you know, a minute or two to ingest all that stuff. I think the, the lack of monitoring is probably a showstopper for some. Uh, I inquired about this yesterday, and apparently there is something in their API 
that will allow for monitoring. So I think it's just a matter now of, you know, if enough people see the utility of this to push Dalim to implement it in, in the way that they're working with the, the Dropbox API. Uh, it's in terms of whether it's useful to make this like a shared folder that you share out for your customers to just quickly dump things in to Dropbox and ingest in the ES. Doesn't sound like a bad idea. But you know, I think uh Dowling's position is let the uh, let the market decide, right? Try it, see if it works for you, and uh suggest what they need to do to push it forward. We we got a question on that. Um is Dropbox ingesting files off the local computer or over the internet? I'd say over the internet, that's why you're using the key to talk directly exactly. to, to uh, Dropbox. Yeah, yeah, it, it's, it's not pulling them off my, my local machine, not at all. And uh, actually that's, uh, I think that's the last of the items to cover. Uh, all right, any questions? Uh, question on if there's any effect to licensing with the new features of dialogue or, or you know, high res proofing. Um, the only effect would be if you want to do a lot of proofing, as Mike showed, with the especially with synchronize on, and you have a lot of people doing it. We definitely would suggest more render engines. And uh, yeah, so since those are basically four at a time, you do have to make sure you have the CPUs on the, the host machine to run all of those. Um, yeah, I think you also have to be sure to uh, instruct your users on the, uh, the, 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 the the ups and downs of using the synchronized option, because yes. it may work perfectly for them, but they might, may wind up making life, life miserable for others. So I think that's something to be used uh, with caution. I'm not, I'm, you know, you, you mentioned, though, Fred, uh, an option in a user profile to uh, limit something mm -hmm. here. What, I'm, I'm not sure what the yeah, sound is you're talking about. Uh, you go under okay. the dialogue settings and the user profiles. Where was it? We saw this, uh, oh, where is it? I don't know if I removed it, but it was there when we got trained on this back at the previous Worldwide Technology meeting. Uh, right here, maximum number of views that must be okay. okay. Yeah, so definitely good to restrict, especially some users from that, and to only give, uh, Users that <laughs> Let's see. Can multi view? Okay, so we got that other question. Can it be disabled and the user profile? Yes, you can just limit them. Uh, someone mentioned that ES6 would only a SAS and all data would be hosted on Darlene servers. That is no. not the case. Um, their licensing model will change where it does a call home. But uh, yeah, six is basically what you're looking at here. Mike's hosting this from one of his VMs, I'm assuming, or our yep. demo server, I'm not sure, but uh, that's no different than it was. Just a licensing model has changed to allow for subscription licensing um, and, and call homes basically every month or a quarter. Yeah, mine's uh, running on a, the, the, the same. It's run on a VM that's on the same laptop that I'm running the thing from, which I'm pretty sure is why it was uh, having a, All right. a, a hissy uh, fit there in the middle. For the uh, search feature, can you search for just specific or inside specific metadata, I believe is the question. That's okay. a good question. And I asked Dalim about that earlier because for my money, this guy, should be either restricted to only metadata hits 
but not the text extraction. Or there should be one that was restricted only to file name, absent any metadata results that may match. Right. Yeah, that, that's what it sounds like it would mean, right? Exact? Yeah, yeah it doesn't. It, 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 like again, it, uh, well, I think I showed this earlier, so like that, that, that Heathrow 3, right? I know that's the file name. So it's reasonable to assume, yeah, yeah, I just want to match that name exactly, but that's not where it's looking. Yeah. So I think they got a little bit of work to do there. But but definitely it's nice to have those options at least now and not have to use the profile to change that. That's a these yeah. are huge. But the, yeah. the other one, what I would do is I would take him out and I would put the substring search option there. Because right. the ter enabling substring search on off makes fuzzy search much easier to access. Yeah. Because that's the, the substring search is typically set to start end, so you can have more open-ended searches. But uh, apparently, there's something in the way uh, Elasticsearch filters these things that doesn't let that work in conjunction with him. That's why you should be able to quickly switch him on and off in here and jump back and forth between this guy, which is something we've requested. All right, and I think that's it. That's all the okay. questions. Sure got them all. So, third Wednesday of the month, right? Yep, third Wednesday of the month. As soon as we have a topic for June. We'll get that out to everybody. It may be more ES6 features, or again, we may go to the twist and some of its features. I think Alex had something in mind he was trying to whip up. Um, but we'll see, as soon as we have that, we'll get that out to everybody. If, so, if there's uh, any ES6 features that you've heard of or you know that are interested in that you'd like to see, let us know. Because uh, I, I know from just playing with it myself, the People who already know the job ticket editor in ES5, when they look at it in ES6, you know, you're going to be lost at first. Mm -hmm. It's uh, it's like you, you you know the game, but they change some of the rules of the game. So you're, you're going to have to kind of rewire the way you think when you're putting those things together. Um, so let us know if there, there's anything in particular that uh, piqued your interest. All right. So everybody, we appreciate your time today. Everybody stay healthy and have a good week.